everyone. Um, uh, first, I'd like to welcome Dr. Firas Khalil, consultant cardiac surgeon and uh, section head of adult cardiac surgery in uh, King Faisal and expert in uh, mechanical circuit support. And uh, he will be helping me during this uh, uh, presentation. Welcome, Dr. Firas. Okay, um, so yeah, um, we'll start with the short uh, mechanical circuitry support. And uh, it's, this uh, presentation is basically an overview of uh, different uh, uh, circuitry support uh, modalities. And uh, uh, just to have a broad idea about all the uh, devices uh, available, not all of them, most of the most common uh, devices and what devices are being used uh, in the region. Uh, and uh, um, we'll focus on the most uh, common use, such as uh, we'll, we'll, when we go over it, we'll, we'll see that we'll focus more on some devices that are commonly used. Okay, so as, as an introduction, short-term mechanical support are designed to be used for a wide range of conditions, ranging from prophylactic uh, to management of cardiogenic shock, acute decompensated heart failure or arrest. And patients in cardiogenic shock require early aggressive therapy to restore a normal cardiac output and maintain end organ perfusion. So, uh, because time is uh, tissue uh, in that case. Uh, so cardiogenic shock uh, um, uh, percentage uh, makes two to 12% of patients after uh, acute MI and post cardiotomy uh, period in the range of 0 0.2 to 0.6% in a post cardiac surgery. So acute decomposition, chronic heart uh, failure patient, also in severe cases of myocarditis and postpartum uh, cardiomyopathy and uh, um, uh, other uh, causes such as viral myocarditis. Okay, so each device in general improve the following parameters. So the goal of the, uh, those devices to improve those uh, parameters of circulatory function with some variations depends on the patients and sizes and uh, device uh, used, the flows that it can reach, and uh, the volume and many uh, many other variables. But in general, the goal is to improve the end organ perfusion and reduce in intracardiac filling pressure reduction in left ventricular volumes, wall stress, and myocardial oxygen consumption. And uh, of course, augmentation of coronary perfusion. Um, four major categories of circuitry SS device. Um, uh, so uh, some uh, divided into intra balloon pump and non intra balloon pump uh, devices. And uh, we're talking about short-term uh, devices. And uh, can um, uh, also um, be divided into percutaneous and non-percutaneous. So start with intra-aortic balloon pump, one of the most common, one, one of the first, let's say the first mechanically support uh, device that's first available and uh, one of the most common used and uh, actually the uh, lower cost. So in general, just in, in, in uh, some of the guidelines, uh, so uh, with the myocardial infarction, the use of uh, intra-aortic uh, balloon pump uh, um, that is not uh, managed or, or uh, quickly reversed with pharmacologic therapy. So routine, routine uh, intra-aortic balloon pump uh, is not recommended and only in selected uh, cases, uh, class three harm. And uh, in acute matter uh, regurgitation, uh, uh, due to papillary muscle rupture, it's uh, uh, European Society of Cardiology Guidelines uh, um, recommend using it for stabilization of patients. Um, so the, basically the concept of uh, uh, intra-aortic balloon pump started in uh, uh, 1968 with uh, Cant uh, Cantruitz uh, reported survival of three patients post-infarction cardiogenic shock with a uh, use of intra-aortic uh, balloon pump. And uh, basically, the intra-aortic balloon pump has two main parts, the console itself and the catheter with the balloon. Uh, and the balloon, uh, usually, uh, the, the gas used in it uh, to inflate it is the um, helium. 
And uh, a long time ago, they used to use the CO2 as it uh, um, uh, uh, has more the uh, diffus diffusion and uh, less risk of air embolism. Uh, but helium, it's used now most often because it's uh, lighter weight in, in deflation inflation. Uh, it's much more, I believe, smoothly uh, inflates and deflates. So the concept of intra-aortic balloon pumps during uh, systole, uh, sorry, let's start diastole. So during diastole, the uh, balloon would uh, inflate and it would uh, augment the uh, pressure, uh, diastolic pressure. So basically increasing diastolic pressure, increasing the coronary perfusion. And uh, uh, during the, the systole, the sudden uh, deflation be just before systole, decrease the afterload and decrease so the demand of the, on the uh, ischemic myocardium in that case. And uh, so that the uh, output uh, would increase. Um, so the main concept is systolic, systolic unloading and diastolic uh, augmentation. Okay, uh, so uh, this is the um, common wave uh, seen on the monitors of the intraaortic balloon. And uh, you can say that he's the, the aortic wave. Usually here we would say the diacrotic notch of the uh, normal uh, uh, arterial wave. And at that time where the, uh, the um, uh, aortic valve closure, <coughs> the balloon inflates and is actually uh, higher than the systolic uh, wave. So, uh, and you can see the, uh, the uh, reduced uh, myocardial uh, consumption uh, and the unassisted, uh, uh, the unassisted wave, you can see that the, the, the wave after that, you see the systolic pressure uh, would uh, be uh, less. Um, so, um, so you can see here that uh, the, that the uh, unassisted, um, um, unassisted aortic pressure uh, here and here is the, uh, uh, um, where it should be if it's not assisted here it's uh, while it's assisted and you can compare those to, uh, uh, those two uh, systolic pressure with the assisted and unassisted I will go over um, okay so um, so it as we said it decreases the LV after load reduction uh, LV wall tension and increase uh, uh, coronary flow uh, 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 velocity increases by 87% and of course, with variability, depends on the stenosis, depends on many uh, volume and many other issues. And uh, of course, it depends on the how elast el elastic is the is the uh, wall of the um, uh, aorta. So, if a young patient, the aortic wall will be very elastic, and the augmentation actually will be less. But in uh, senior patients, uh, the augmentation will be more because. Um, of the elasticity uh, will be less and the pressure will be uh, more. Uh, so factors that uh, uh, affect, so the heart rate, mean arterial pressure, stroke volume, systemic vascular resistance, all those play in the vari uh, variation uh, of augmentation. And um, uh, so uh, what, in, what uh, factors that affect the augmentation uh, with, within the uh, console itself or the ba balloon, the, uh, the, the sheath, if the, if the balloon is unfolded, uh, if there is kink, if there is leak in the gas, and if there is low helium concentration. Uh, of course, the timing, if it's wrong timing and how it will be affecting it, we'll go through that uh, just uh, quickly. So um, how to check if it's working well, we change the ratio uh, from one to one to one to two. So instead of uh, the balloon inflating in each cycle, it will inflate in every other cycle so that you can uh, analyze the uh, uh, wave. Uh, and uh, so you check the diacrotic notch. Uh, and uh, where is it? So that if it's inflating at the right uh, place, and usually it will look like a V inflation time. Check the inflation time. Okay, and then the, you can check the diastolic augmented uh, wave is more than the systolic uh, wave. So this, this is the diastole and you'll see that it's the, the wave it should be higher than the systolic wave. 
and uh, the confirm that the uh, indiacelic wave following the augmented wave is less than the non-augmented wave. Uh, so you can see here, uh, this is this is non-augmented wave because here the balloon did not inflate. So th this pressure would be higher because it's not uh, compared to uh, this one. Um, Okay, so the, what's our common problems with the b b inflation? So it can be early inflation. So if early inflation before the aortic closure, actually it, it, uh, what will happen, uh, the aortic valve will close prematurely. So it'll end up, you'll end the systole uh, prematurely. And uh, by that you will increase the less volume is, uh, how can we say, ejected out of the, Heart. So there's increase in left ventricle and in, in diastolic volume, and by that increase in left ventricle and diastolic pressure and uh, wedge, uh, increase uh, in the stress on the wall, uh, and actually that's um, counteracting or contradicting the, 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 the goal of the use of the uh, intraaortic balloon pump. And it might actually cause some aortic uh, uh, regurgitation. What about late inflation? Late inflation uh, will cause suboptimal diastolic augmentation. So not, uh, you're not using the full duration of the diastole to augment uh, the pressure. So the, sorry, inflating late. And uh, so it will be suboptimal coronary perfusion. Uh, you can uh, actually, while inflating in the right place at the diacrotic notch, you can get a, a much better um, augmentation and your diastolic augmentation will be even higher here. Okay, what about uh, early deflation? Early deflation would be uh, the same thing. You did not use the whole the diastole period, so you have suboptimal coronary perfusion and potential for retrograde actually coronary uh, carotid uh, blood flow. So you have higher uh, uh, blood flow during diastole and suddenly you deflate before, uh, before the, the cyst, uh, before systole. That might actually cause uh, uh, bl uh, blood flow retrogradely from the coronaries to the aorta uh, and will cause some uh, ischemia. Um, uh, late deflation, late deflation uh, will actually, so that you're actually deflating after, during systole. Uh, you're not deflating just before systole. And uh, so the afterload reduction, you will lose this uh, physiological benefit and you'll actually uh, increase the uh, uh, myocardial uh, cons uh, oxygen consumption because the uh, ventricle is acting against a uh, inflated balloon, so more afterload, more resistance. Okay, um, so in general indications, so cardiogenic shock after MI, mechanical complications, especially MR and VSD, uh, it's very helpful. Uh, in cabbage patient with the LV dysfunction, one of the uh, modalities that can, that can help and uh, consider low cost. And with the uh, intractable ischemic arrhythmias, you can help with that. Also with uh, non-surgical uh, revascularization, high-risk coronary interventions, such as uh, 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 complex uh, um, uh, lesions. So uh, contraindications. So of course, uh, aortic regurgitation high on the list uh, for as a contraindication because it's um, basically uh, uh, you'll get uh, increase in aortic uh, regurgitation, and uh, that will be um, um, increased in myocardial oxygen demand and etc. Uh, in case of aortic dissection, remember that uh, the aortic balloon, uh, we place it uh, at, uh, mostly, not always, but mostly through the femoral artery and retrograde fashion. And in case of aortic dissection, you can go into the uh, false lumen or even if it's in the ascending aorta and you're placing it intra op, um, um, maybe if it's under direct vision, I'm not sure about that. Um, uh, severe and in case in case of severe, of course, perfectly uh, uh, vascular disease, uh, that will be uh, increased risk of uh, limb uh, ischemia. So, in techniques of insertion, um, usually, you, as we said, uh, common femoral artery, percutaneous uh, technique, and 
Okay. Alternative strategies it can be inserted uh, through the iliac, axillary arteries, uh, abdominal aorta, and uh, usually used in patients with severe aorta iliac or femoral occlusal disease. And placement of intraortic bone pump with a graft soon to the subclavian artery is a strategy that's allowed to ambulation. Uh, so because it, there is nothing in the femorals, it's up there uh, uh, at the axillary artery and the patient can ambulate uh, and you avoid all the uh, issues with uh, uh, delayed ambulation. Uh, this is a study that shows the benefits of uh, auxiliary approach for anti-aortic balloon pump, and it's used in as a bridge to uh, transplant. They showed they they, they called it one of the uh, 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 biggest study for to show to show that uh, effect, uh, and so that they uh, ambulated the patients in post-operative uh, day one uh, using this auxiliary approach, and it was successful to. Uh, uh, bridge them to uh, transplant. So positioning of the uh, catheter, uh, usually it's at the level of the bifurcation of the uh, right left bronchi, so you can see here, and uh, this is a, a mal-positioned uh, uh, intraortic balloon pump. This is correctly positioned intraortic balloon pump, and usually interop we don't, uh, we, um, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, transesophageal echocardiogram, is uh, sufficient to confirm the uh, position. This is another picture, just showing the uh, positioning. So what we expect with intraortic balloon pump, we, uh, we expect the, uh, with, with some variability to increase the, to decrease the systolic blood pressure by 20%, increase aortic diastolic pressure by 30%, increase the mean arterial uh, pressure, and reduction in heart rate by 20%, and decrease in the wedge, by 20% and elevation in cardiac output by 20%. Um, okay, we went over this. Um, uh, in general, I, uh, we already mentioned this, but there is usually a uh, two timing or triggers that were used to uh, trigger the inflation of the anterior balloon bump, pump. It's whether ECG or arterial waveform. ECG, if the patient is regular rhythm, uh, everything is fine, so that's the that's the ideal situation. If not, arterial waveform is a better um, is a better uh, uh, modality for that because uh, the ECG can have uh, 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 irregularity and it will be it will affect the uh, inflation. Arterial waveform would be a better option. Oh, okay, just that repeated slide, sorry. Um, okay, this is just uh, showing it uh, with the ECG. The, uh, this is, um, anyone can tell me what kind, what ratio of uh, uh, augmentation is this? Just to make it. Uh, one to one? Yes, uh, uh, correct, one to one. Okay. Abd Abdullah? Yeah. Um, um, one sixteen. This is the mean augmentate, augmentation or um, or the diastolic. Uh, I believe it's the, the the diastolic augmentation. The diastolic augmentation. Uh, I'm not sure if someone can help me with that, but yeah, that's what I know. Because uh, I ask. Many consultants and all of them, they gave me different answer. One said it's augmented diastolic. One said it's augmented mean. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. Augmented uh, mean, uh, but if it's augmented mean, it would it would uh, it would it would reflect on the uh, uh, arterial line uh, pressure. If it's augmented mean of the whole pressure, it would reflect here. But uh, it would make sense if it's because the diastolic augmented should be higher than the uh, mean, uh, so, or, or uh, even sorry, systolic. Yeah, I need the augmented should be diastolic augmented should be higher than the systolic. So that's why it makes sense to be the me uh, the uh, diastolic augmented. That's how I understand. So it should it should be reflect on the patient, right? 
if it's reflect in the patient, the diastolic should be more, it's equal to the augmentation. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so you mean it should be here high? Yes. Um, you're right. Uh, but, um, okay, uh, if it's... <clears throat> Yeah, you're right. I don't know. Actually, I don't know. Uh, unless the arterial line is uh, um, like at the femoral and it's not actually detecting the augmenta augmentation. You understand what I mean? Like if the um, pressure uh, pressure augmented is, is, is sensing, sensing it at the femoral. Uh, can, can, I, uh, can I just uh, have a comment? Um, just... Uh, um, uh, Hussein. Sam. What I understand, and I, I mean, normally that, uh, and you can't systolic pressure or diastolic pressure. Okay. Um, you, ca you can see the systolic pressure is 102. Tamam? Okay. And this is, uh, before the balloon, uh, will inflate. Tamam? Tamam. And, and when the aortic bulb is open and the balloon is deflated, this is uh, they had the peak pressure in the systole, which is 102. Tamam? Okay. Once now there is the aortic notch and the balloon will inflate, you can observe that the pressure in the stole now is higher. You can see it's higher than the systolic pressure. See the, the red tracing, the arterial line tracing. Tamam? Okay. This Tamam. one is 100, 116, the augmented pressure. Tamam? Before, Tamam. now, bef at the end of the stall, before, before uh, systole and, uh, and uh, while the balloon deflated, okay, when the balloon deflates, the afterload, the afterload will decrease, preparing for the next uh, stroke volume, preparing for the next, uh, I mean, for the next uh, bump, for the next ejection. So that the, the heart will face now the diastolic pressure, which is the augmented also diastolic pressure by deflation, which is 52. So this 116 is a diastolic pressure during the balloon inflated. The day 52 is the diastolic, diastolic pressure. Diastolic pressure during the yeah. balloon yeah. inflation. Yeah. During and the augmentation. During the augmentation. The 52 is the diastolic pressure where the heart will face during ejection, next ejection. Which is 52. So your aim here, the balloon will work in two things will work in augmenting the diastole and the, uh, and during the diastole to increase the coronary perfusion, تمام? and also will decrease the end of diastole by deflation to prepare for to decrease the afterload on the heart. تمام? So this 116 and 52, this is the effect of the balloon. I, be, I believe uh, that 52 is the pressure at... Um, yes, at the here. end. Here. Here. Yeah, this is this is yeah, and this one, this pressure. If you do, if you just switch off the balloon, this pressure will go higher, because you will not you will not have yeah. the, the 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 benefit of balloon when it's deflate. Because when the balloon deflate, yeah, at the end of systole, uh, at the end of uh, <coughs> the diastole, when it's deflate, it's co it called it causes something like a negative pressure. So it will decrease the afterload. And once mm -hmm. this 52 the diastolic pressure, as long as it goes lower. So this is in benefit of decreasing the afterload in the heart. Tamam? Yani, اللي تقصدوا إنه ال 116 هذا augmented diastolic وال 52 هذا نهاية diastolic بعد نهاية diastolic by deflation. يعني هذا 160 while the balloon is inflated, 52 is the effect of deflation. Tamam? معناته peak, not mean. أيوة. يعني هذا ال peak. يعني هذا when the balloon inflate. يعني ال 116 بتكون البيك دايستوليك بريشر وايل ذا بالون از انفليتد وال 52 يعني البيك دايستوليك بريشر وايل ذا بالون از ديفليتد يا سلام طيب يعني انت الحين عندك طيب دقيقه طيب السؤال الثاني طيب ليه لما احط البالون 1 تو 2 ما يتغير شيء في الارقام يعني المفروض اذا كلامك يعني انا فهمت كلامك بس المفروض بناء على النظريه اللي انت قاعد تقولها انه لما احطها 1 تو 2 المفروض ال 52 هذه في في البيت اللي ما فيها اوجمنتيشن تكون اكثر صحيح 100% صحيح راح تكون اكثر 
اكيد راح تكون اكثر يا yeah, راح تكون اكثر لان ان اسيستد كم باك وان سلايد دكتور فريد معنا اوكي ستوب هير يس Go ahead and tell, uh, ask your question now, uh, Hussein. But this is late deflation. This is late. This is not not the normal. If you put a normal one, for example, one to one, is better. It will be more. This is abnormal. There was a slide, uh, was a slide that shows uh, that one shows to one, one to two, one to one two, two, normal one to two. One to two. I don't know if you have it here. Uh, I don't think I have it. Ah, uh, that's it. Yeah. No, good one. Good. Repeated okay. slide. This one. <laughs> no, this one? No, no. Uh, uh, go, uh, back uh, uh, go back to the balloon. Okay. More, more. Okay. You can stop here, please. Yeah. هذا 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 كويس ترى شوف اسيستد ان اسيستد اوكي سو اسك يور كويشن ناو يا حكيم الاول ولا الثاني؟ الثاني اوف وي بوت ذا بالون 1 تو 2 ذير از ويل بي ديفرنت ان دايستوليك بريشر اون ذا مونيتور سو ذا ويز اوجمنتيشن ذا دايستوليك بريشر ويل بي لو ويزاوت اوجمنتيشن ذا دايستوليك بريشر ويل بي هاير ذان ذا فيرست وان از ذات رايت اور نوت؟ Yeah, this one and this one, right? Yeah, this is higher than this one. Not the augmented. يعني the augmentation, طبعا في البالون بيكون أعلى لأنه you augment the stolent. عرفت شلون? But at the end, when it deflates, أكيد the pressure will be on the regular, the non-assisted one will be higher than the assisted one. عرفت شلون? Yeah, here. بكرة. هذه طبعا. Now you saw this. You saw the patient put in one to two. Go to the monitor, please. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry. And the monitors still show the same numbers. Sahih Hussain had a sualak? Sah. Okay. Assuming, of course, the graft is what we saw earlier, level one to two. But the numbers did not change. How do you explain that? And طبعا أنت في أنت أنت رأي أنت رأي فرق يا دكتور أنت الحين برضو اللاين اللي تقرأه هل هو اللي في الب أنت قاعد تقرأ من البالون ولا قاعد تقرأ من الراديال لأنه يختل يخ يعني في اختلافات وهل ولا نفسه أنا راح يكون نفس بعض لكن غالبا راح يكون نفس بعض. I was saying if you're reading from the camera, for example. No, basically what you okay. said. I, I am familiar with different. What you said, uh, Khalid, is the right um, uh, explanation for the numbers when you put it on one to one. But also when you put it on one to two, and you saw the graph there, it still will give you the same reading. Why? Because it still low, uh, read the lowest diastolic. Uh, so the 52 will be still the lowest diastolic in one beat. And the other bit, it will be higher, but it will not read the higher. It will always read the lowest diastolic. And the same for the uh, systolic. The systolic may change a little bit. It may go up a little bit because of the abnormal uh, heartbeat without the assist of the balloon. So the, the systolic may go a little bit higher, but the augmented one will still the same, be the same because it's dependent on the diastolic pressure and the size of the balloon inflation, which is the blue line here, the blue line uh, adjacent to the 116. So the only change that you may see, uh, Hussein, mm -hmm. just like uh, Khalid said, the only thing that you, you, your um, 102 reading may change a little bit higher. So go back. Uh, Abdullah to the uh, graph that shows one to two. Okay. Okay. So, so if you look at one to two uh, here, any, any one of them, it doesn't matter. Okay. 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 So um, um, this is uh, this is abnormal. It will not uh, help. Show us another one. Uh, Okay. 
Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay. Uh, well, normal inflation, normal deflation. Okay. So the yeah. diastolic pressure here and the, um, the balloon, uh, the statement that says balloon aortic and diastolic pressure will be the same because it's really the lowest, right? The augmented one, which is here peak diastolic pressure, is the augmented pressure wave, which is 116. This value here, this value here is, uh, is going to be reading more. It will be actually reading more here in this area, a little bit more. Uh, sorry, not in this one, in, the, in this one here. So if you read this one, uh, this number. Yeah, because it, slightly, it, will, it will face a higher pressure in the, the next beat, and it will be not assisted, but will, the systolic pressure will be higher a little bit. If you look at it, it's, um, it's, uh, it's one, two millimeter higher than the second beat. The first beat bef uh, before the um, balloon inflation and the second beat without any balloon inflation, there's a slight difference of maybe two or three millimeters there, right? So it will reflect on the 102 reading. It will be slightly higher. It will be slightly higher. Otherwise, what uh, Khalid is exactly what uh, the explanation is. Fahimta Hassan? Fahimta Habas. No, the, 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 the monitor, it's, it's, count, it's reading one beat. So like if, we, if, no, if, it's, the if, if there is premature ventricular contraction, the well, blood well, pressure will reflect on that beat. Yes, the, so actually what it, the monitor measure for the 102, it measure the highest systolic, normal systolic according to the ECG normal systolic wave. So it may change from one beat to another. It may give you uh, the highest reading in this few minutes, a few seconds here, and the six beats that you see or 10 beats that you see. Okay. And, the same, and the same for the diastolic, the 52. It will give you the lowest reading according to the ECG, okay? okay. The augmented, the 116, it will measure it during diastole, the highest value, any of these highest value, it will be taken. So if you have one augmented and one not augmented, let's say the non-augmented measure 80. So it actually will measure, give you the reading of 116. So mm -hmm. I, uh, the, that I think will answer your question. Uh, Abdullah, what is the 84? It's the mean of the... Uh, between where, is, those... where, is, where is that? Let me say the mean. Uh -huh. Where is it in the monitor? Where is it on the graph? The uh, mean, it's here. <laughs> okay, but I mean, which it's point? The distance, the distance, the distance under the curve. Oh, point? under the curve, under the curve. Okay, so, so there are two types of monitor. One type will measure the area under the curve. Okay, so, and calculate it over a period of time. So you will have all these heartbeats counted you have one, two, three, four green ones, five, six, seven, eight beats missing, and it will calculate the area under the, uh, the grid graph and will give you the mean. But this monitor is using a different technique, most likely. It's the second technique, which is it counts the highest uh, value plus the lowest value divided by two. So if you take, what's the highest value, Abdullah? Uh, highest value would be uh, uh, the augmentation high, uh, 160. 160. and the lowest would be 52. So this plus that, how much? Uh, 118, 100 and... I, I just did calculation, exactly 84, huh? <laughs> huh? 160. <laughs> Okay, so this is the second uh, type of monitor, and you have to know your monitor. How does it calculate the uh, the uh, the, uh, the mean? So you, you so, take it. But so in general, the 80, the 84, that's the diastolic okay. mean, right? The same. So um, the message from this is that not a single value is important. The shape of the graph is very important, and the trend if you are, for example, looking at cardiac output, so you look at the mean over a period of time and see the mean is improving, this means the heart function is getting better. 
well, it's getting worse, huh? or your volume may be changing, or your anitropes may be changing. So the trend of those numbers and the shape of the graft. Okay, Hussein, uh, what's the question? The 84, this is the diastolic mean. On the accounts that we did. Because 116, augmented diastolic. ثاني لحظه هو he, he does not look at it as, a, as you label it you may label it diastolic it may be systolic فرضا فرضا this patient have no augmentation okay and the systolic blood pressure is 116 and the diastolic pressure is 52 so it doesn't matter it's only it will only pick up out of all these four numbers it will take the highest number and the lowest number and it will give you the mean of those two numbers يعني حسين باختصار ما ما تطلع لك هي سيستولي ديستولي تطلع لك هاير بريشر لور بريشر وات ايفر وير ات از عرفت لانه نورمالي احنا احنا بس احنا نورمالي نقول هاير بريشر سيستول لور بريشر ديستول ان بالون از ديفرنت لان عندك اوجمنتيشن ديورينج ديستول والهاير بريشر ويل بي اللي هو ديورينج اوجمنتيشن اوكي ثانك يو طيب معلش دكتور عندي سؤال بس انه مش 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 قبل ما نبدا في هو از كونسلتنت ان ذس كيس توداي مين معكم كونسلتنت دكتور فراس خليل موجود دكتور خليل فراس فريس فراس خليل خليل نعم اوكي اورايت طيب سوري سوري فور يعني فور انتروجكشن بس جو اهيد يو مي وان تو اسك هيم ذوس كويشنز اند اف يو هاف اني اذر فيوتشر كويشنز فور ذات I was going to say, Faisal, do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. Dr. Farid, if you have a question, what is the mean arterial pressure in the monitor? It is considered the highest plus the lowest pressure over two. This is not the case of the mean arterial pressure. Is this the way to get the mean arterial pressure? Okay, so what uh, what do you usually use when we are asked, yani, as a medical student, and we are asked to find out what's the mean? We calculate in a different way. You remember this way? Yes. What is it? Uh, systolic pressure times two plus systolic pressure, all divided uh, by three. Okay, and and this is by the way, it's it's not all the monitors will follow this rule. Many of the monitors on the on the market will follow the uh, area under the curve. Okay, some will follow the numbers, and it's and, and that's why I suspected. In this case, I may be mistaken, in a sense that he may be measuring the area and giving you the exact mean according to the area. But I find it interesting that some monitors use only the highest value, the lowest value, and give you the mean of those two values. And I suspect this monitor is one of them. Okay, uh, one one possibility is just that the uh, monitor is this is actually the same monitor as the intraaortic balloon pump and the, the, so it's all connected so it's measuring this uh, systolic blood pressure just before inflation uh, or or the like يعني, uh, the maximum just before inflation and measuring the diastole just after deflation and uh, so excluding that and adding it here um, so the the, uh, the type of monitor, uh, the type of monitor, and how does it work? They are usually يعني, standard of care or less standard machines. They have used either this or that. Uh, it's not like it's maybe this or maybe that. No, it's either this or that. Doctor, but just I have a simple question. And I'll reply to the question. Normally, we how we measure the mean arterial pressure is diastole plus one third of the pulse pressure. So this is true in normal physiological يعني, heartbeat, whereas the diastole taking uh, longer duration than systole uh, in terms of uh, mean pressure. But we are, when we're talking about intraortic balloon bump, and then, uh, another a peak of, of pressure during diastole. For, in here, we cannot say that diastole is longer than the, 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 the systole. That's why we are taking me, uh, uh, diastole that is a total pulse pressure. So in, in, in this term, I think your explanation by dividing on two is uh, more appropriate because we have a, a longer duration of, 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 of higher pressure here in intraortic balloon bump. Khalid, he depends on the monitor. So even a normal patient, 
كلام خالد صحيح لانه اتس بيست اون اتس بيست اون ذا ثيوري ذا ثيوري از هاو لونج از ذس اند هاو لونج هاو لونج از ذس سو ماني انتروتيك بالون بامبس يو اند اب وذ ايكوال ريشيو بس ذاتس يعني اتس نوت ذا ستاندرد اي جست لايك سيد ماني بيبل ماني ماشينز maybe i would say 80 90% of the machines will use the area under the curve divided by the number of heartbeats but some of the machines for simplicity will use only the peak and the and the and the lowest the, the largest value and the smallest value and divided by 2 assuming that assuming that we have equal uh, uh, timing for diastole and systole i mean regarding the waveform etc so uh, But, but in general, يعني if it's a normal heartbeat, yes, the systole is much shorter. It's a 0.3 uh, milliseconds, I think, or it's, uh, 0.3 seconds, and the uh, systole is 0.5 seconds. So the ratio is one, almost one to two. Mm -hmm. Okay, in, uh, in case of, um, uh, so go to uh, move to removal of the uh, device. So a pectinase can be removed without exposing the uh, femoral puncture uh, site. So the site is prepped and securing sutures are uh, cut and the balloon catheter uh, disconnected from the uh, pump and uh, completely deflated using a 50 ml uh, syringe. Uh, the proximal artery is uh, compressed and retrograde bleeding is uh, Uh, allowed uh, to bleed, which flushes any uh, distal clot in the uh, wound. Uh, distal femoral artery then compressed and anti-grade uh, flushing uh, then is allowed uh, to uh, flush out any clots. And finally, a, a steady non-occlusive pressure uh, is held over the puncture site uh, and maintained uh, for uh, 30 minutes. Uh, If the balloon is inserted by a cut down, preferably is removed in the OR for possible uh, repair and like examination. So complications in general vary between uh, 12 to 12 to 30%. So leg ischemia would be the most common complication incidence up to 25%. And uh, balloon rupture, thrombosis within the balloon. Um, other uh, complications, septicemia and infection at the certain insertion site, especially with uh, long uh, uh, insertion duration, um, and bleeding, false aneurysm formation, lymphistilla, and lymphocytes. Sorry. Sorry. I had fat in my content. Okay. Um, uh, Um, of course, uh, pre-insertion uh, status of the pedal pulses uh, and neurological examination the documented to avoid any, uh, to, to uh, know if there's any complication happen. So results, time of uh, insertion affects hospital mortality. So pre-operative insertion associated with mortality for 19% and uh, uh, for intraoperative insertion uh, uh, is 32% and post-operative insertion associated with uh, mortality 40%. And uh, prophylactic uh, insertion uh, uh, is not recommended. Um, uh, the guidelines, the recommendation of uh, uh, interior shock. Shabab, just a mic, free mic. Okay. Um, uh, class 1B and in the AHA 2013 guidelines, um, uh, anteriotic balloon pump is reasonable in patients with STEMI who are hemodynamically unstable require urgent uh, cabbage. Uh, this is from uh, uh, European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery. Uh, so uh, recommendation of 2B in, in patient with uh, Uh, acute coronary syndrome, cardiogenic shock, short-term mechanical support, uh, and uh, the routine use is not recommended of the balloon um, uh, pump. Um, in this study, 600 patients presented with acute myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, uh, will be treated with uh, revascularization. Uh, 300 patients received the balloon pump and uh, uh, around 300 uh, only medically, there is no difference in mortality 
uh, with use of intraortic balloon pump or the, uh, control. And uh, um, also there was no difference in adverse events, but uh, still some uh, phys physicians would recommend using it. So we'll move on to the direct cir uh, circuitry support. Abdullah, you can ask a question about the intraortic balloon. Sometimes you said it's recommended, not recommended to use it as a prophylactic, but in, in practice, we are using intraballoon bump in patient with tight left main or low mm -hmm. ejection of fraction going for surgery before induction of anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't think it's, uh, I meant I went this way, I meant in a routine prophylactic or when there is no like, uh, okay, just in case, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right, Yanni, yeah, with high-risk procedures, high-risk, as I mentioned before, high-risk uh, uh, percutaneous procedures, uh, complex coronaries, or uh, uh, high-grade left main, uh, 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 it's recommended. So I agree, I think it's like not uh, phrased uh, properly, Yanni, this sentence. Sorry, Hussain. The, the, the previous, uh, <laughs> previous practice, was to use an intraortic balloon pump as a routine for all high-risk patients. For example, a patient came uh, to the cath lab and found to have a tight left main. So there was like a routine use and refer for cabbage. So it's been uh, used before as a routine for any patient with a complex anatomy uh, to use intraortic balloon pump or with a patient to the left main. However, uh, in different hospital, uh, at least uh, in, in, in the things I'm, I'm seeing in different center when I rotate uh, with them. Nowadays, it is not a routine to be used with all patients, even anatomically uh, severe left main disease, depend on the patient symptoms. If the patient is stable, nauseous pain, nothing, there is no need to put intraortic balloon pump prophylactic as a routine. But if patient with uh, ongoing chest pain, that need to go for urgent cabbage. At that time, even in the cath lab, when you review the case, uh, you ask the cardiologist to uh, put intraortic balloon pump before shifting the patient for the OR, not because mainly of the left main, but because of the situation, the clinical uh, situation of the patient that require the intraortic balloon pump. At the end, is a clinical is a clinical judgment more than. Uh, more than use it as, 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 as a balloon. And this is why in the recent recommendation, in the guideline, they said it is not uh, to be used as a routine because any things you give the patient or any procedure or any drugs, there will be an adverse effect can, can, uh, can happen. So unless the patient need it, you don't use it. Is it clear now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, this is what they mean by routine using. Okay, so uh, now move to direct circuitry support. <clears throat> so um, just to just to add the last, uh, you're right, uh, Haytham. Uh, there are many diversity and paradoxical studies about use utilization of intraortic balloon pump into in the cath lab, and. Uh, the main fear when a cardiologist or an interventional cardiologist uses intraortic balloon pump is when there is a bad target and uh, terrible runoff. So they utilize, and of course, when you have a severe tight lift main that every time you engage, you have a damping pressure. So you utilize during that time, the intraortic balloon pump to increase the coronary perfusion in, in case of damping pressure because you know, in these uh, uh, critical stenotic uh, or sub-occlusive uh, coronaries, you, you risk of uh, uh, lack of perfusion for the coronaries and VFib. So that's where, but it still remain up to date, uh, paradoxical. And there is an old school and a new school. The old school still follow more often utilization of balloon pump. The new school, basically they, they are uh, rarely using Thank you, Victor. Um, so we'll move to the more interesting devices. Um, uh, would be like um, ideal device, like the definition of an ideal device that 
um, the manufacturing or uh, targeting so it should be ca uh, capable of providing adequate flow, maximizing hemodynamics, unloading the left ventricle, and it fits all patients of all sizes, and diminish the risk of infection, avoid uh, inflammatory response, and uh, et cetera. Okay, so indications in general uh, can be uh, a bridge to decision, bridge to bridge, bridge to transplantation. Uh, we'll talk about this more in detail later on and other, uh, this, uh, other indications. Uh, in terms of hemodynamic, uh, in general, general uh, like uh, cardiogenic shock or, uh, or, or hemodynamic instability, with cardiac index less than 2.2 liter per minute per meter square, systolic blood pressure less than 90, uh, wedge pressure uh, more than 20, with uh, concomitant use of two uh, inotropes with uh, high doses. Uh, so devices, there are many devices available, and uh, devices currently approved by the FDA include uh, vena arterial ECMO, Impeller devices and uh, Thoratec uh, Centrimag, Thoratec Paracorporeal uh, VAD, and uh, Tandem Heart System. Uh, so ECMO, yeah, uh, it's a, basically a direct extension of principal cardiopulmonary bypass. So the system consists of the following uh, membrane oxygenator with integrated heat exchanger system uh, and uh, centrifugal pump heat exchanger and uh, the circuit interface between the patient and the system. Uh, the new ones are bicompatible heparin uh, bonded uh, circuits. Uh, so uh, different types of uh, pumps, roller pumps, impeller pumps, and centrifugal pumps. Uh, as you can see here, the roller pump, uh, impeller, and uh, centrifugal. And um, uh, here is the ECMO uh, circuit. Blood uh, is, uh, this is for VA, drained uh, from the uh, right uh, uh, atrium of a central ECMO in this case. And uh, of course, heparin fluid and, and then the membrane oxygenator. Uh, um, you have here the uh, oxygen and CO2 blender and the heat exchanger here and then back into the uh, aorta. Um, so ECMO principle, the principle behind the ECMO is that desaturated blood is drained by venous cannula and CO2 is removed. O2 is added through the device and blood and then returned to the system via circulation, uh, via, whether via another vein, VV ECMO or R3 VA uh, ECMO. So indication so yeah. I'm sorry, Abdullah, just to add one more thing regarding of the extension to uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. You, you have to know this is a closed circuit. So mm -hmm. under any circumstances, you do not add any uh, stopcock and uh, utilize it for uh, whatever you need. If you need, in case of needing for ultrafiltration, then you have to add it in the venous line, not in the arterial line. So simply, if there is an, any small bubble that's going to travel into the circuit, it's going to be somehow filtered in the membranous oxygenation. However, you're not going to count on that. So you use that in the high-risk severe cases. However, keep in mind, this is a complete closed circuit. No one is allowed from the ICU cardiologist, cardiac surgeon, VAT, uh, or ECMO coordinator to utilize the blood in the circuit for venous blood gas or arterial blood gas. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So uh, go into indications. So hypoxic respiratory failure with the ratio of uh, oxygen, uh, arterial oxygen tension to fraction of inspired oxygen less than 100 uh, millimeter mercury despite op optimization of ventilator settings. Hypercapnic respiratory failure, uh, uh, ventilatory support as a bridge to lung uh, transplantation or uh, as a uh, bridge to cardiac transplantation, and uh, uh, cardiac secretory failure, refractory cardiogenic shock, case of massive pulmonary embolism with hemodynamic compromise, and uh, cardiac arrest uh, failure to win from cardiopulmonary uh, or fair, uh, failure to win from cardiopulmonary bypass after cardiac surgery. Uh, and uh, bridge to either um, 
link transfer uh, or ventric assist device. I'll just here, here put a few slides about the indications in case uh, of COVID, uh, COVID since it's the uh, season. Uh, and um, uh, so we can see that um, um, basically it start with uh, treating the uh, in ECMO it's mainly the uh, in COVID it's mainly about the VV ECMO and uh, the uh, um, of course tr treating the underlying uh, problem and lung protective strategy uh, diuresis and all other effective drugs and uh, to check the, if the uh, uh, arterial oxygen to FI2 ratio is less than 150 or it's more than uh, or equal to 150. If it's less than 150, uh, prompt positioning is uh, strongly recommended and uh, with neurovascular uh, blockade and high PEEP strategy and uh, 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 recruitment maneuvers, if that all uh, patient uh, ratio uh, less than uh, um, uh, 80 uh, for six hours or a fi to less than 50 and uh, uh, if uh, if it's uh, if it's uh, if, if it's no if it's not does not meet that uh, criteria okay so to continue the patient is improving if yes you go to the other uh, uh, arm of the uh, guideline whether the the ratio is uh, higher um, uh, ph is uh, low and the uh, uh, partial pressure for carbon dioxide is more than 60 millimeter mercury, more than six hours. Uh, you can uh, uh, you can you go to the uh, you can see if there is contraindications. Uh, we'll go over the contraindications in the next slide. Uh, if there is no contraindications, uh, you go with the ECMO. If there's contraindications, consider adjunctive uh, therapies. So uh, in general, in that case, uh, refractory hypoxemia. Uh, um, with all the um, uh, and worsening hypercapnia, uh, although using all the uh, protective strategies and uh, ARDS, ongoing uh, requirement for vasoactive drugs and patient uh, condition is worsening, and uh, or single organ failure uh, uh, with uh, minor comorbidities. Um, here they mentioned the AKI is not a comorbidity. Contraindication would be severe multiple comorbidities, uh, immunocompromised status, chronic lung disease, uh, critical congenital heart disease, severe global developmental delay, uh, neurological complications, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, irreversible uh, brain damage, uncontrolled hemorrhage. Uh, there's contraindication to anticoagulation, uh, long stay on mechanical ventilation more than two weeks. Uh, before the ECMO and uh, some some anomalies, um, and the one interesting question for uh, pay for uh, healthcare providers to uh, taking care of the ECMO with COVID patients, that whether the the uh, SARS-CoV-2 the coronavirus the, does not spread, uh, uh, whether it's spread through the oxygenator and all those precautions and need for a viral um, filter at the oxygenator. As you know that the oxygenator after some time there could be some effluent or, uh, or plasma leak and whether this can be aerosolized and uh, cause some infection in the room. And this study uh, was recently published on the 11th of uh, June uh, journal of uh, American Journal of uh, Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. Uh, they uh, showed that the um, they took 27 patients and uh, uh, they were testing whether it's uh, the spread through the ECMO or the RSS membrane. And uh, uh, so, um, so here were eight positive samples, 25 positive samples, and uh, of course they checked the plasma. If there is viremia. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, four were positive. Here, 13 were positive. Uh, and uh, of course, all the pas uh, patients were in included were uh, uh, PCR nasal swab uh, positive, but uh, which patient had a viremia detected uh, virus in the plasma? Uh, out of those 13, uh, all those patients would, uh, uh, the, uh, they, they checked the um, uh, influent from the uh, from the oxygenator 
within 48 hours. They checked all the patients after 48 hours of instituting whether ECMO or dialysis. Uh, all of them were negative, and uh, so their recommendation, their uh, conclusion is that there it's un, uh, it's it does not spread, and it's very unlikely, and they cannot exclude the, the transmission if it's longer than 48 hours because uh, there can be some uh, uh, like oxygenator uh, malfunction and more leaking. Uh, they cannot rule it out. But it's an interesting finding, uh, and they don't recommend the use of uh, routine use of uh, viral filter in the oxygenator with the ECMO. Um, okay, we'll just move to general and general ECMO uh, cannulation. Uh, whether central or peripheral cannulation, uh, all come with the pros and cons. Uh, central cannulation, it's uh, uh, more, um, how can I say, it's more physiological interoperative with existing right atrial and aortic cannulas and the peripheral cannulas uh, uh, with the surgical cut down, uh, direct versus side graft uh, uh, cannulation. Uh, so the arterial cannulas come in many uh, sizes, 16 to 20 French, venous cannulas come in 18 to 25 uh, French uh, sizes and um, Usually in the peripheral cannula, the long cannula is directed to the right atrium under TE guidance and uh, an eight to 10 uh, uh, French cannula in, the, uh, uh, in case of uh, peripheral cannulation. Um, of course, flows are four to six liters. Okay, maintenance and monitoring. Um, once the respiratory and hemodynamic uh, goals have been achieved, the flow is maintained. So the oximetry pressure monitoring uh, of the mean arterial pressure, the pre-pump pressure and uh, pre-post uh, uh, oxygenator uh, pressure, uh, uh, vital parameters, such as heart rate, respiratory rate and temperature, flow rates, neurological status, uh, vascular status of the uh, lower limb to be monitored on a regular uh, basis and uh, um, anti-coagulation with, uh, with the ACT target of 180 to 210 seconds. Uh, complications, uh, of course there's complications to each uh, technique whether central or peripheral. Complications including uh, bleeding, thromboembolism, cannulation related or heparin induced thrombocytopenia neurological complications and uh, leg ischemia. So uh, in terms of uh, cannulation related complications, uh, vessel perforation and hemorrhage, arterial dissection, uh, bleeding, distal ischemia and VA ECMO. So that's the treatment or some sort of regular uh, routine, regular uh, distal reperfusion cannula. So you have the arterial cannula and the, and the, the femoral artery, and you have another uh, uh, reperfusion cannula uh, uh, to perfuse the uh, uh, distal limb. Another, um, another new cannula, I'm not sure if it's uh, available, and uh, we have actually the same cannula have another uh, like opening here where it will uh, uh, infuse the uh, retrograde uh, flow to the uh, distal limb. It is existent and it's approved and it's from Livanova uh, company. However, positioning this cannula is uh, not easy because you, uh, other, uh, other than uh, directly inserting this cannula, you're not gonna be sure of where the mouth of the uh, lower limb uh, anti-grade perfusion will be. Because you might enter it one centimeter more inside that can hit the posterior wall, or mm -hmm. you might uh, uh, escape the puncture site and you cause hematomas in the subcutaneous uh, tissue. So it's, it's there, but it's mm -hmm. not super recommended. And another point in regarding this of the anterior uh, anti-grade uh, lower limb perfusion cannula, uh, the advice of going uh, between five to nine French to avoid thrombosis. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move to the Harlequin syndrome <clears throat> or North-South uh, syndrome. So, uh, yeah. Yes, kindly, I want to 
actually ask and clarify uh, something with Dr. Faraz regarding a post uh, cardiotomy syndrome, post cardiac surgery. Uh, there is like three schools for uh, the site. If I need ECMO, the site for ECMO, either to go central and uh, keep it as it is and confer the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit to the ECMO circuit and keep the chest open and uh, close uh, that with ESMER. The other uh, approach is uh, to keep it central, but with the closing of the chest and bring the cannula through, uh, like, uh, like through the chest tube, but keep it central. The third option is to convert it to peripheral via femoral. What is the prefer and when to use? Yani if, for example, if the patient is coagulopathic, I, of course, maybe we will go towards uh, central and keep ESMER. And also the argument for closing the chest and keep it central, it is more less infection and less bleeding as well in case of bleeding. Which approach you prefer? Or you go just peripherally and close the chest? That's a very good question, Haytham. Uh, you mentioned uh, different schools, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I follow and I'll explain why. So in, uh, in post-cardiotomy uh, shock, cardiogenic shock, or, or basically it's a, it's a cardiogenic shock due to X, Y, Z reasons, and you have to treat case by case. And if, if you have a sternotomy, then why do you want to go and cut the femoral? So you always keep it in the sternum. And there are benefits and advantages more than the disadvantages. So you go ahead and you insert it centrally for, number one, avoid another incision and cut down. Number two, uh, depending on how bad the ventricle. If the ventricle is 25 30% ejecting, yet it's still... Uh, dependent on the bypass uh, or the ECMO, uh, you insert it directly VA through the right atrium and through the ascending aorta without putting a vent. If the heart is really a stunned myocardium, then you need to insert a third cannula, attach it with a Y extender to the venous circuit, and insert that mainly in the pulmonary artery. Mm -hmm. And it's going to act as a sucking. So it's going to go to the, to the venous circuit. You could also make a small purse string and add that cannula, the same what you utilize in, in uh, LV vent. You attach it to the right superior pulmonary vein and you empty the ventricle. And the reason, because of the stunned heart, you're going to have stagnation of the left ventricle. You're going to have stagnation of, of blood in the left atrium and you will have white lung and pulmonary edema. So you need to empty that because there is no ejection. Um, however, it always depends what kind of surgery. If you're putting a valve, a mitral valve, regardless if it's a bioprosthesis or if it's mechanical, and you go ahead and you empty the left atrium or you empty the uh, pulmonary artery, through, uh, 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 so you will empty the left ventricle and left atrium, you're gonna have a thrombus on the mitral bioprosthesis or mechanical prosthesis. You might not need to do that. You might just simply do VA ECMO centrally and depend on epinephrine to keep the heart ejecting. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you want to do uh, a closed sternum, tunnel both cannulas uh, under the sternum, subxiphoid, <clears throat> or keep the sternum open and close it with an ESMER, this depends how long are you anticipating to have the ECMO in the patient. If you close the patient and the to avoid bleeding, you might end up in tamponade and reopening the patient and induce the patient to further infection, especially you open these cases most probably in the CCU or CSICU. And you don't wanna do that. The, uh, if the patient is staying for a prolonged period and you really took care of the uh, bleeding, you, you might close it, close the sternum, and uh, wait for a couple of weeks or, or so until you anticipate recovery for the ventricles. If you would think that this is gonna be a two day or four day uh, ECMO, five days ECMO, like sometimes even post heart transplantation, 
with a marginal donor, you don't close the chest. You mm -hmm. just keep it open. You even uh, uh, observe the bulge if there is a bleeding. You treat it accordingly. But as I'm saying, it's a case-to-case -case, uh, um, thing. The only way I go to femoral if I'm not doing sternotomy. And in cardiogenic shock, acute cardiogenic shock, when you have an INR of 10 or 5 or 7, and you have congested liver, and you want to really avoid bleeding, then you would go for femoral until you upgrade it to centrally or to uh, a prolonged duration or even to a heart transplantation. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Faraz, uh, we just have a, a small question, if you allow me. Father. Hello. Uh, طبعا uh, I definitely agree with you that uh, whenever we are putting ECMO, we need to طبعا ECMO per se it will increase the afterload of the heart and we need to empty the left side uh, whether by a vent or with uh, putting uh, an intra balloon pump to uh, help the left side or by putting an intra support. But my question is uh, which modality will you, will you use in case of having uh, a prosthesis I mean, post cardiotomy syndrome and a, a, a new implanted prosthesis on the left side, especially if it's a mechanical mitral, and you need to put it on ECMO. Because we had a, a few cases that uh, we faced in like after two, three days that uh, high gradient through the mitral valve and clot formation due to uh, unloading of the left side and the, the valve was not opening. So there's a stagnation and the clots on the, left, on, on the, left, on the mitral valve. So, which modality? I mean, how you how, what? What's your strategy to avoid such clotting on patient uh, patient in ECMO with the recent valves? So that's another good question. But you know, cardiac surgery is not about performing the surgery now and then deal with the complication tomorrow or after surgery and get out. You know, we're not technicians. We, we are medical doctors that have to do a thorough and a proper preoperative investigation and assessment where we should anticipate uh, uh, putting an extra uh, support or uh, a further surgery for the patient. Now, your patient, when he goes to surgery, you choose the uh, bioprosthesis or mechanical prosthesis with the patient, right? So if the patient has good LV function, if the patient doesn't have comorbidities, then you have no problem putting whatever valve you have. And, and you try to avoid having uh, post-cardiotomy syndrome because this, this is, it's iatrogenic. It's either you took the CERC, it's either a prolonged bypass time, it's either uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, you took a stitch on the irita, you, you uh, and you caused the aortic valve that you had to deal with and fix. Um, so... Other than that, you should not um, uh, uh, make your choices of prosthesis according to anticipating ECMO or not. However, if the patient have, especially in severe mitral regurgitation, mitral stenosis and pulmonary hypertension are treatable because once you remove the blockage, your pulmonary pressure is gonna drop immediately. In regurgitation, not necessarily the case. You have a long-standing uh, pulmonary hypertension with severe MR, and this will most probably not gonna go away post-operative, even if you fi fix the mitral valve. So if the patient have still good LV function, then I would uh, uh, give the choices to the patient, and if he wants mechanical, I would go ahead mechanical, having in my mind that I have to be very, very meticulous in my surgery, zero margin of error, and quick. Uh, cross clamp time. If the patient have uh, moderate or severe LV dysfunction, then at that uh, 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 then at that time, my choice is going to be bioprosthesis, and I would evaluate intraoperative, preoperative, the myocardial function, and I would even anticipate putting an ECMO uh, in the patient uh, as a support because you don't want to also wait a few hours until the patient crash and you go ahead and put a support. In severe mitral regurgitation with severe pulmonary hypertension and moderate or moderate severe or severe LV dysfunction, you need to anticipate uh, the possibility of ECMO and then you should plan your, your uh, choice of biprosthesis in advance. Bearing in mind, when you put an ECMO, 
don't put it as a, a complete unloaded to the ventricle. Just put it two third and keep epinephrine running. You need yeah. a, a adrenaline to be in there. So just to recruit the, to the smallest chance of the uh, ventricle and uh, accept the lactate when it runs. That, that's clear. Uh, because my question is because I see like two to three cases, even with the tissue valve, uh, they had a clot. But I think what you said is uh, fair enough. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, interesting discussion. Um, okay, we'll move to the Harlequin syndrome. Uh, uh, Harlequin syndrome basically uh, when um, during a peripheral cannulation. Uh, so uh, saturation of the upper uh, part of the body is lower than the uh, lower half uh, due to flow competition between the heart and uh, the heart and normal lung and versus the ECMO. So, uh, so the high cardiac output from the native recovering heart prevents retrograde uh, flow of the ECMO. And uh, so you'll get, uh, if, if, there's, if the lung is not working, if there's pulmonary dysfunction, uh, you get blue head where you can get a deoxygenated, okay, let's go to the picture, it's much clearer here. Okay, so you, your uh, peripheral cannula is in the uh, femoral, a peripheral cannula, you'll get, you're getting a retrograde flow. If the heart is recovering and it's uh, have a good ejection, the, uh, uh, and the lungs are not working, not, uh, or like ed edematous, uh, not oxygenating the blood very well here, whatever blood is going to the coronaries, to the uh, limbs and uh, brain will be deoxygenated and maybe you have a, the uh, mixing cloud uh, here or whatever. And uh, of course, if you uh, increase the um, um, oxygenation, uh, sorry, the flow too much, you might uh, extend the LV. We'll go into more details of that uh, later on. This is a good, um, a summary from the uh, extracorporeal uh, organization, uh, extracorporeal life organization. So this is uh, just a um, um, uh, diagram of that. So you have the peripheral uh, ECMO, you have the uh, uh, flow from peripherally uh, upwards, retrogradely, and you have anti-grade flow of the normal uh, heart pumping. So those clouds, uh, uh, represent the uh, mixing of the blood from the uh, heart and from the ECMO. It depends on the how good is the uh, ejection from the heart and how uh, much is the flow from the uh, ECMO. You'll have mixing cloud here and here. If the, uh, as we said, if the blood, uh, if the lung is bad, you'll get um, uh, deoxygenated blood uh, of that. And there's a, um, and you can, uh, you can monitor the uh, oxygenation of the upper body by putting a pulse oximeter on the brain or on the head or on the right upper limb. And uh, Okay, since when? Now? Maybe 40 seconds, something like that. Okay. Okay, so I'll just repeat here. Okay, so um, I was just saying that the, um, is it clear now, Faitham? Yes, Hello? yes, it's clear. Okay, it's okay good. Uh, so the blood flow for retrogradely from the uh, ECMO, integrately from the heart, and if you have uh, bad lungs, you'll get deoxygenated blood, uh, uh, blue uh, blue blood going to the brain and the arms, and those those represent the mixing cloud. It depends on the flow from the um, um, ECMO and uh, from the ejection from the heart, and you can uh, monitor that by putting a uh, pulse oximetry on the right hand, uh, right upper limb, and the cerebral oxygen uh, saturation also, and uh, to, uh, to balance that. Um, also, uh, there's an, uh, there is another solution, which is the uh, BAV-ECMO, uh, which is uh, basically um, 
uh, you have your venous cannula in the right atrium, you have your arterial cannula in the femoral, and you, you take another uh, cannula, put it in the internal jugular in the right atrium, uh, so part of the oxygenated blood is going to the, uh, uh, this in case of bad lungs or, or not functioning lung, lungs, uh, so we we'll get an oxygenated blood to the uh, right atrium, and uh, uh, so the whatever the heart is, uh, uh, it, of course, it's go to the lungs and then back to the LV and then to the uh, upper part of the body. You'll avoid that uh, the oxygenated blood going to the brain and uh, to the coronaries. Uh, okay, about preventing the recognizing the uh, complication of uh, peripheral um, um, limb ischemia. Can, can I just interrupt? I, I don't know if you do, gentlemen and ladies like me to give input uh, during the uh, presentation or uh, just keep it till the end. No, no, sure, sure. Please. Uh, uh, during sorry. the presentation. During the right. presentation. So, so the VAB ECMO is, is uh, a good alternative for this such a phenomena. However, you have to always question why why have we uh, 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 ended up by having this such syndrome? So it's, it's either, uh, of course, the lungs are bad, but, it's, but the reason that the heart is ejecting whatever non-oxygenated uh, blood is because the heart is recovering, or it's because the systemic vascular resistance is high. So you need to treat either or. So you could do the echocardiography and, and it can elaborate further more about the myocardial function. And if the heart recovers, you don't need VA ECMO anymore. You can convert it into a VB ECMO until the, the lung recovers. The other alternative is you lower the peripheral vascular resistance by giving uh, uh, anti-hypertensive uh, medication, mainly when you are in the ICU with these machines, nipride and... Uh, uh, nitroglycerin is, is a drug of choice that's been utilized in the CSICU, uh, mainly nipride. You lower the uh, vascular resistance and uh, that will give the chance for the outflow from the ECMO uh, reaches everywhere. The second thing is you increase the flow of the ECMO. So simply you empty the heart and you're going to have end up by having an ejection of 500 versus 4 liter of the ECMO. So these are the two alternatives, but if the heart recovers, do not wait long on the heart. You, you avoid a complication by simply converting it into veno venous ECMO. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Firas, some, some article mentioned um, if we can put the LV vent uh, to empty the heart. So what do you think of that? Any action is a comorbid action, especially in ECMO. So unless you have a dead heart, stunned heart that eject 10, 15, 20%, and you started to have congestion in the lung, you do not insert a, a vent. Especially when you have a peripheral ECMO, you're gonna have to insert the vent either through, through septostomy which is a very comorbid uh, 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 procedure or technique, or you're going to have to insert through a mini thoracotomy uh, a vent into the right supraventricular vein. So I would really avoid uh, further uh, insult to the patient and causing bleeding, etc., where we're going to go into another vicious cycle. Thank you. Okay. Um... So about preventing the uh, recognize uh, the complication of lower limb, uh, and so bleeding uh, the cannulation inside and uh, thrombosis from the circuit and uh, infections, and uh, so of course uh, doing a regular uh, neurological examination of lower limb, and um, some might um, I'm not sure this is uh, reasonable, but this is from the ELSO uh, EEG monit uh, monitoring and CT scan as needed versus uh, routine. Uh, uh, and um, continuous um, uh, monitoring of the cerebral oximetry. Um, whenever you plan to put an ECMO or, or, or have a, like, to have a, or a question of a referral for ECMO, 
a question you should, you should put in mind or you, can, you should ask yourself, uh, what is the exit strategy for such patient? Is it bridge to recovery? Is it a chance of recovery and weaning? Is it a bridge to transplantation? And um, if recovery is unfeasible unfe and uh, or to, uh, to decision to decide later on if he's a candidate or bridge to bridge, or uh, of course, uh, bridge to death in case of um, um, organ donation is indicated. Okay, LV venting. Um, um, uh, Dr. Faraz just um, mentioned about this and uh, uh, doing extra things might cause extra problems. I just am listing here the options of venting. And, uh, so LV output, uh, you should watch the possibility uh, and should monitor to avoid LV distension, especially in the of, in case of uh, uh, peripheral ECMO, in case of uh, malignant like arrhythmias and the heart, the heart is not actually ejecting. Uh, you should watch the arterial uh, pulse fertility. So you should, uh, you should see that there is um, systolic blood pressure uh, not only like uh, systolic and diastolic, there is a uh, difference between them more than uh, uh, 10 um, or 20. And um, uh, you start with medical management, use of inotropes, uh, essential in this population, dubutamine, melanone. Uh, you can use intraortic balloon pumps, which uh, will be venting the, uh, the LV indirectly and uh, surgical uh, vent uh, in case of a respiratory pulmonary vein or apical vent uh, from the apex uh, can be done also with uh, minimal invasive options. Um, HL septostomy, uh, which is an option probably maybe not sure, but maybe in pediatrics more than adults. Also other uh, devices uh, which help uh, the mentioning later, it's a tandem, a tandem heart, which uh, basically uh, venting directly, we'll show it later on. And impella um, can be used uh, to vent uh, the heart and its combination with the ECMO called Ecpella, and it's basically uh, an axial pump from the LV, pump uh, open the LV. Um, Abdullah, so. um, the, the idea of treatment is to decrease the vascular resistance and decrease the amount of blood ejected from the heart. So. How come dubutamine will, will, uh, will help in this situation? Uh, dubutamine will work mainly on the myocardium, I believe. Uh, well, if it, it is in, in low doses, it will work in myocardium as contractility. And when <clears throat> they use it, it will decrease the uh, systemic vascular resistance. Yeah. It's not, uh, I, I don't think it's a, a, a strong uh, alpha, uh, agonist uh, uh, or, or, or it doesn't and the basic constriction effect of it I'm not sure but I don't believe it's uh, one of the main drugs that cause a high increase in vascular resistance no it, you it are does right. the opposite you are it's right. Right. an right. ion so, or so, so yes they need to yeah, exactly. uh, uh, dobutamine or milrinone or uh, uh, adrenaline is simply to mainly work on the ventricular uh, myocardium for ejection it, uh, we really don't, um, because usually, most of the time these patients are not having a high blood pressure. So most of the time you really don't need to have uh, vasodilators uh, for the patient to have a proper ejection. These patients are post cardiogenic shock and they are ending up by low uh, mean pressure. So what you need basically is uh, an inotrope to increase the contractility rather than increasing uh, the alpha effect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is again from the ELSO, the, the options they're uh, uh, mentioning uh, here. Um, um, this they're just mentioning with, like you should uh, keep in mind who, which patients are uh, at risk for LB distension, left ventricle ejection fraction less than 30 uh, prior to ECMO, and pulse pressure, the difference is less than 20, and uh, aortic valve uh, is not opening. Uh, and uh, wedge is more than uh, 20. Uh, those, if they lasted more than two to six hours uh, from uh, ECMO start. So like vigilant and uh, continuous monitoring of the patient condition um, in case uh, required. Okay, uh, newer devices. 
just one thing I want to emphasize about uh, one point you mentioned, mm -hmm. which is the exit strategy. Yeah. It's very, this is usually, uh, it, it's supposed to be in our mind as a cardiac surgeon when they refer patient for ECMO or even when, our, when we are facing a post-cardiotomy uh, syndrome, what is my exit strategy? Even if you are uh, the one consulted, when you speak with your consultant and senior, you need to have this in your mind to tell him, what is the exit strategy? What is the prognosis before you are proceeding with ECMO for any indication? This is very, very important uh, uh, one. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But uh, Haytham, sometimes you don't have an exit strategy and uh, you put an ECMO for as a bridge to decision. And sometimes even if you don't have an exit strategy, your exit is to optimize the patient by unloading uh, the end organ uh, um, congestion and mm -hmm. uh, making sure to uh, diurese the patient uh, having uh, a high cardiac output until you uh, uh, are able to induce uh, some of the anti-heart failure medication and optimize the patient uh, while you are weaning to off. You can wean the patient to off and, and uh, simply have nothing else. Some patients, they, they are not qualified for heart transplantation, uh, neither for assist devices. And these are the patients that most probably you're gonna have a, a bridge to decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alexandra. Actually, actually, the first time I heard about exit strategy from you, Dr. Karas, interesting to, way to think about it. We all learn, my friend. Uh, yes, Muno uh, Yes, uh, I have one question regarding the VA. Uh, is it possible to use it uh, intraoperatively in cardiac surgery instead of the bypass machine? Uh, the, the short answer is uh, yes, and uh, um, uh, but maybe Dr. Faraz uh, can elaborate more on that. Can you tell me the question because uh, the voice? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was asking about VA, VA ECMO uh, as a closed circuit. Uh, if we can use it, use it uh, during uh, cardiac surgery. Yes, you could. You could in certain surgeries. You could do it uh, in. Uh, uh, beating heart uh, or fibrillating heart uh, coronary artery bypass. So uh, it can be utilized. Mm -hmm. It can also be utilized uh, for uh, ELVAD uh, implantation as well. But uh, what I think, Dr. Dr. Faraz, that they don't prefer to use an ec a VA ECMO for cardiac surgery because it's, it's a closed circuit and we are using suckers and uh, we need to add some medications. So an open circuit with just a regular bypass is preferable. Is that right? That's, that's why we always have an open circuit with reservoir as a bypass machine. But the question is that could you use VA ECMO in heart surgery? And the answer is yes. There are certain cases. And the reason why they are doing it is they want to um, minimize the uh, side effects of uh, open circuit uh, in heart surgery and some patients who are prone to complication like uh, 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 chronic kidney disease uh, patient, like patients with, uh, with infection that you don't want it to, uh, to be uh, disseminated and prone for further inflammatory reactions due to the, uh, the open circuit. So there are so many th reasons that you do close. But that's another school that not anyone follows. This, you're talking about probably less than three, four percent of, of people who are utilizing this, and there is no study talking uh, uh, the uh, against it or with it prone to to, to such. Uh, however, theory, yes, you you uh, reduce the cytokines, the inflammatory reactions, where you're gonna uh, uh, not be prone to hypotension and uh, cytotoxins that's gonna go and attack certain end organ such as uh, kidneys and uh, chronic kidney disease. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, so, um, uh, Okay, we'll talk now about uh, newer devices. Uh, Just, uh, uh, no. uh, now we will speak about new device. Uh, is it half lecture? You finish your half lecture? Uh, 
تقريبا توك اباوت نيور ديفايسز اند ذن افتر ذات ويل ستارت وذ ذا لونج تيرم يو ونا لايك يو سجستينج ا بريك جست يعني فور لايك 5 10 minutes is it hard picture or not yet قريبا يعني حيثم خليه يخلص النيو ديفايسز وبعدين يروح ناخذ بريك قبل الله قبل لونج لونج تفضل اوكي سو كارديو هيلب اتس بيسكلي كومباكت ذس از ات كومباكت ايكمو سيستم وذ لو برايمنج فوليوم اند انتجريتد اوكسجينيتر um is small size good for transport and safe for transporting patients and they showed in a study that uh, after arrival at accepting that like transferring patients uh, survival was uh, 62% uh, tandem heart um, it's a percutaneous ventricular assist device uh, fda approved for uh, short term less than 6 hours uh, cannulas are introduced from the femoral vessel by either percutaneous or direct insertion technique cannula delivered across the atrial septum and outflow uh, typically is directed through the uh, common femoral artery and uh, position is facilitated uh, and confirmed by uh, fluoroscopy and uh, it has uh, the uh, advantage of uh, excellent left atrial decompression and why is that because it's actually in, in the left atrium uh, and you actually puncture the septum um uh, yeah and so we'll have a, a good um so basically you're having good decompression of the left ventricle and they claim that it's um, uh, um, easy and feasible to uh, insert uh, this is the actual how it looks like the uh, uh, machine and this is the pump itself uh, this is the cannula through the uh, uh, artery um So uh, most experience has been in the cat lab to facilitate high risk PCI. Uh, flows up to four liters are typical with surgical cannulas uh, and with sur- bigger surgical cannulas up to eight liters. And uh, when placing a long-term VAD in a patient tandem support, uh, if, if you exceed that six hours and um, long-term, um, uh, maybe it's necessary to uh, repair the atrial septum. Um, and uh, ACT targets uh, with anticoagulation is uh, a target of 200 and RVAT configuration is uh, the uh, manufacturer claimed that it's possible. Um, uh, this is in uh, this is an, uh, an RVAT configuration. Uh, we use a cannula, dual cannula, where uh, the blood is getting the inflows here and the outflows here. The blood is going inside and then uh, uh, um, pumped again to the uh, pulmonary artery and acting as an uh, R band. Uh, centrimag pump, uh, centrifugal pump requires only very small priming volume. Uh, it can be configured both for right and left sided support and uh, central cannulation by a medium sternotomy up to 10 liters of support can be achieved and it's uh, FDA approved for uh, uh, six hours uh, of use as an LVAD and 40, 30 days and, uh, as an RVAD. Uh, this, is, uh, this is how it looks and um, um, here you can see, you see the, um, the RVAD uh, Uh, configuration to the pulmonary artery and the elbow configuration uh, left atrium to the aorta um, yeah this is the console and uh, again okay the one of the new devices the impeller is basically a microaxial pump and can be inserted peripheral and central cannulation and um, it's directed across the aortic valve uh, Um, can you uh, portion of the device across the aortic valve with, with a motor, axial motor. And uh, the diameter of the cannula um, allow easy coaptation of the aortic leaflets, uh, especially in patients with uh, minimal, uh, with some degree of uh, aortic insufficiency. This uh, device, uh, one of the few devices that are uh, uh, probably ideal in case of uh, aortic insufficiency. So, uh, usually inserted through the femoral artery uh, up to the LV, 
and uh, the uh, inflow will be here, outflow will be here. Uh, it can also be inserted uh, in uh, many different uh, ways. Uh, this uh, how it looks, uh, and um, yeah, um, yeah, this is how it looks in real life. And uh, it's deployed under fluoroscopic echocardiographic guidance, and blood is aspirated through the distal tip. Uh, from the left ventricle and pumped into the ascending uh, aorta. So it comes in many types. So there is the 2.5 CP5, uh, and uh, there is the LD, I'll show it in the next picture. So 2.5 generates up to 2.5 liter and requires 12 French catheter, CP, 4 liters, 14 French catheter. The 5 uh, requires um, uh, surgical cut down and uh, 21 French. Uh, down the femoral artery or commonly insertion through the vascular graft to the axillary artery. Um, uh, this is the ampulla RP for the right ventricle and uh, it's uh, basically the opposite. Uh, he here will be the output, here will be the input, so this will be in the IVC, this will be in the uh, uh, pulmonary artery and it will be uh, acting as an RVAD and it can give an um, flow up to four liters. And the diameter of the catheter is 11 French. Uh, this is the Ampilla LD. It's, um, it's, um, uh, uh, it, it can go up to five liters. It's basically different. Uh, it's, it's the device that can be used to directly insert it, insert it through the ascending uh, aorta to the uh, LV. And, um, the same concept, uh, axial uh, uh, pump. It's basically all those pumps based on the concept of uh, Archimedes screw. It's basically it's all the concept of uh, pumping the water uh, um, uh, in Egypt uh, in the uh, I think third century or something. So um, the concept is uh, simple. Um, okay, heart uh, mate. Uh, Pump, it's basically an impeller-like uh, pump uh, designed to place through the femoral artery, direct to the aortic back to the left ventricle, and uh, it can generate the flow four to five uh, liters. And uh, that's uh, how it uh, looks. Um, uh, a little bit different uh, in case that uh, it comes in a mesh and then you release it. Um, so, uh, uh, two trials are here. The first trial compared the uh, Protect 2, uh, which compared the Impella to the balloon uh, pump, and uh, patient undergoing PCI due to three vessel disease with impaired left ventricle ejection fraction and need for the mechanical support. The uh, Impella 2.5 had a better 90 days outcomes compared to the balloon pump. Uh, lower rate of repeating uh, revascularization, less uh, readmissions and worse events. And uh, there's a, um, uh, um, uh, the HeartMate uh, uh, Pectinase Pump. Uh, there's a uh, still ongoing study comparing this device to the Impella, and still there's uh, no results. Um, okay. Um, in general, uh, dev and the device selection out of those devices, uh, there's no data to recommend one device over the another. Selection is usually based on availability and the center you're working in. And patients undergoing CPR are best served with urgent uh, femoral uh, cannulation or devices that can be urgently inserted. And this avoids the time delay uh, of transportation sternotomy. Patients with severe hypoxia and lung injury benefits from oxygenation with lung rest and ECMO. And uh, post-cardiotomy support, um, typically in patients are supported for 48 to 72 hours, uh, of course, with uh, transplant evaluation if uh, feasible. Um, then they are transi transitioned to more uh, long-term de uh, device uh, uh, or another center with uh, uh, long-term uh, device uh, mechanical support options, uh, uh, bi-ventricle support, uh, we'll talk about it later on. Um, maybe I have a few slides on the, uh, some slides before I finish on the patient management. Uh, Dr. Hiras, you have any comment here about those devices? Uh, not really, I think you gave a thorough uh, 
presentation on all of them. Um, I just want to talk about the Impella uh, mm -hmm. 2.5 and uh, the CP, which is 3.5. It's mainly use, uh, used in the cath lab by the cardiologist percutaneously. And they're uh, FDA approved for three days, but people keep it for a week. The, uh, uh, the Ampilla 5.0, which is uh, LP for the left side and RP for the right side, they are by the surgeon, and you mentioned it perfectly well. Um, uh, you can utilize ECMO and Ampilla together to empty the ventricle and uh, avoid the white lungs. Uh, you can have the Ampilla. The Ampilla usually are uh, uh, approved for 10 uh, days to two weeks, the 5.0, and uh, uh, usually you have to have... Uh, it's for a uh, very acute um, uh, pathology that you have to have a plan. It's a bridge to bridge. So basically you either upgrade it to an ECMO, uh, central ECMO, or you might upgrade it to uh, uh, an, a durable LVAD devices. Mm -hmm. The PHP uh, HeartMate is, uh, yeah. is basically recent. And uh, the reason it's uh, still ongoing bec trial because no one is using it very minimal. Due to the uh, the price, it's more expensive than the Impella, and it's equal to the Impella, and centers are comfortable with it, so that's why they didn't jump into the PHP, and they were more interested in, in having the HeartMates 3 uh, more than that. The Protect Duo that you talked about in Tandem Heart, uh, which is cardiac assess device, it's uh, utilized uh, not frequently, mainly for a support as uh, to the RV, to a temporary R RV failure, after implanting uh, a durable LVAD. Uh, it's a challenging uh, implantation through the jugular to the uh, PA through the uh, right atrium, but uh, it works very well and uh, it can be attached to its own pump, the cardiac assist, or it can be attached because it's a cannula and you can attach it to the centrimac. Um, these are just the ones that I wanna mention. Okay, thank you, Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Faraz? Tadal. <laughs> Uh, regarding the Impella CB, uh, do you think we will use it more and more? I mean, instead of ECMO, for example, in acute uh, postcardiotomy syndrome that is related to LV failure. You think in the future that we will utilize uh, Impella CB more than we are utilizing ECMO? You know, uh, that's a good question. Um, I really hope so, but we don't, and we will, will not. Uh, the reason why, because it's an unstable device. So you attach it uh, uh, through the, uh, through the uh, femoral mainly, and it can dislocate easily. You can, uh, you can uh, have it jump out from the aorta. You can have it uh, sucking, uh, having a suck down, uh, sucking the ventricles since it's, it's really next to the septum. So, um, and uh, especially the CP, it's, it's not a big flow. It's, uh, it tells you 3.5, but it, it's, what I've seen, it's maximum 3.4 that it gives. It, according to the patient size, yeah, you can have a patient of 50 kilograms, that's perfect, that's a full flow. But if you have a patient of 90, that's not even, not even barely half flow. So uh, you're not going to have the proper effect, especially if he is that big or she is that big. You're going to end up by having a high RPM, 12,000, because the main, the main RPMs are 9,000 and 10,000, and it's caused hemolysis. And that's why FDA approved it for such a short period of time, three days only for the CP, which is a 3.5. And I think it's seven or 10 days approval for the LP, which is, which is the 5.0 and 5 liter. So there is a complication and mainly hemolysis and dislocation and suck down. So I'm not really sure we're gonna utilize it. It's gonna be for a short period of time. It's gonna be for improving the ventricle and loading the ventricle while you're having ECMO, but ECMO is gonna remain. Mm. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, just a few more slides before we take a break. Uh, so um, patient management of those uh, uh, patients with, those, uh, with such devices, ideally pump flow uh, would achieve a mi mixed venous uh, saturation of uh, greater than 70% and low flow state can often be corrected with intravascular volume expansion. Uh, uh, centrifugal um, uh, pump speed can be adjusted to control 
flow to allow some cardiac ejection to decrease stasis and intracardiac thrombus formation. And uh, excessive pump speeds can also cause significant uh, hemolysis. Uh, fluid administration is the best way to increase flow. However, right-sided uh, failure uh, uh, may manifest as low flow state in the presence of uh, low pulmonary artery uh, uh, pressure. Um, just talk about uh, weaning. Uh, so uh, trial is usually attempted after 48 uh, to 72 hours of support. Uh, critical not to rush weaning to allow time for myocardia uh, recovery uh, as well as end organ recovery. And flows reduce uh, gradually at increments of uh, 0.5 to 1 uh, liter per minute. Adequate anticoagulation is critical during this uh, low flow. Uh, because uh, less flow, more stasis, more uh, clotting. Uh, in general, it's recommended to reduce the flow uh, less than uh, two liter uh, for, uh, uh, not recommended to reduce less than two liter for a prolonged time. And uh, of course, with optimal pharmacological uh, um, support and continuous evaluation of, with echocardiogram, uh, echocardiography, sorry, to uh, uh, decide upon weaning. Uh, maintenance of cardiac index and uh, um, pressure, low pulmonary pressure with the uh, left ventricle function by echo, and <clears throat> uh, and in case if you face a, a failed attempt of weaning, you should go back to full flow. Um, uh, patient to our uh, transplant candidate um, undergo a full evaluation for uh, or long term uh, durable device. Uh, decision. This is again from the ELSO uh, weaning. You assess um, laboratory, echo, and ECMO parameters. Uh, uh, um, most of the uh, things that we mentioned before, the, and uh, here about the APTT. If it's less than sixty, to give uh, to give fifty units per kg uh, in case of weaning, just to make sure uh, well anticoagulated and uh, with um, um, echo and uh, uh, those are the parameters uh, you check for and you check there is no severe uh, regurgitation and uh, a good LV function would be more than uh, uh, 30% um, and uh, then a successful win. Uh, this is a good summary of the uh, short-term uh, support from uh, up to date, so we have the VV ECMO, the uh, RVAD, and you can see here that the uh, to decrease the LVAD support, VV will not will actually increase the RV load, but no increase on in the LV load. Um, and uh, uh, VA ECMO, uh, of course, depends on the central or peripheral cannulation, but uh, usually the same. And um, and with a VAV, we already mentioned it. Here is the uh, bipella, where you have uh, two impellas, the, R, uh, the right side impella and the left side impella, the same patient. It will help, of course, both uh, side, uh, sides, uh, the RV and the uh, LV act as RVAD and LVAD. And uh, the, you have the ECPELLA, well, when you have the um, uh, um, peripheral, uh, peripheral uh, ECMO, you can put the uh, impella and the LV to unload uh, the uh, left ventricle and have the left ventricle and uh, give it time to rest. Uh, key points, uh, recognize cardiogenic shock in the preoperative and postoperative patient. Have available uh, at an institution at least one of the available temporary support systems. Uh, initiate pharmacologic and first line mechanical support. Uh, the balloon pump attempt to treat causative issues recognize uh, when these conservative methods fail and act quickly to implement direct cardiac support to restore, uh, to restore perfusion to the organs, initiate a discussion with advanced uh, uh, heart failure uh, uh, team and uh, stabilize the patient uh, transfer to center if it's uh, on the center. Okay, we'll um, maybe take a, a break here, uh, Haytham. Yes. Dr. Faraz, can we take a break for 10 minutes? Absolutely. Okay. 